Well, good morning. Uh, this morning, as already been said, we'll be carrying on our study in First Peter, and this time we're uh, into chapter two. And this middle portion, uh, this middle section of Peter's letter, actually goes all the way through to uh, chapter three and verse twelve. You know, I don't want to put restraints on whoever's going to speak afterwards, uh, but to me, uh, it emphasises submission. Uh, that we are called on to submit, to be in subjection to, uh, and this is a key element in the life of the believer. Now, this is uh, quite a relevant topic for today, I think, isn't it? Uh, when we have lawlessness and, and people who have that don't tell me what to do attitude. Uh, you know, the, the anti-lockdown people, the, the anti-vax people, the anti-mask people, those who say, well, the, no government's going to tell me what to do. And, and we even see it in some churches too. No government is going to tell me or us how to worship God. Uh, in a, and in a very real way, this passage is very relevant to us. Uh, it's not a popular topic. Uh, people tend not to talk about submission, or being in subjection, or being uh, submissive to, to anybody, but it's a very important one. And Peter applies the theme of submission to the life of the believer in five ways in this section. Now, we're not going to speak about them all this morning. Uh, I'm going to leave a few for somebody else in the next few weeks. Uh, but he talks about uh, submission in the life of a believer as a good citizen, and that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, the, the submission in the life of a believer as a slave. And there were slaves at that time. Uh, he goes on in, in later in chapter 3 to talk about submission as a marriage partner and as a member of the Christian assembly. So these are some things that will be coming out in, in, as we study through the rest of First Peter here. We're just looking at the first two today. Christians submitting themselves as good citizens and, and slaves submitting themselves to masters. Now most preachers would probably jump in and say, well actually there's no slaves to masters these days, so we're talking about employers and employees. Well that is a way we could apply that, this passage. But we're going to look at the context and see how Peter actually applies it here. So let's get to let's get to grip with terms to start off with. Submit, what does it actually mean? Be subject to, what does it actually mean? Well, in the Greek, it's a military term. It's a military term. I could tell you the Greek word, and you'll probably straight away think of a coffee machine, hupotasso. Anybody got a tassimo? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's nothing to do with coffee. Hupo means under, tasso means to be arranged. So the Greek word means to be arranged under. It talks about rank, it talks about being subject, it talks about being submissive. To be arranged under. A general, a colonel, a major, you get the picture, it's a military term, there are ranks, there is submission, there is a placing, an arranging underneath. Now, to get a context here of what's being talked about, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder for later, and I don't want to jump the gun, and I don't want to use too many idioms either, uh, but if we turn to uh, chapter 3 and verse 22, we'll see this said of the Lord Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. You get the picture? This is what, we've been, what is being talked about when we talk about submission. This is what's being talked about. It's not slavery, it's not subjugation, but it's simply a recognition of God's authority in our lives and then under the authority of others and it would include the word obedience so we're looking at submiss submission of uh, obedience so first of all then let's think about christian conduct as citizens this goes down from verse 13 
down to verse 17. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 tells us in everything we do, we should give glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Now Peter was careful here to point out that Christians in society are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is something as Christians we must remember every second of our day and of our life. We are representatives of Jesus Christ. And we saw this last week in verse 9 of chapter 2. For you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may what? Declare the praises of God. This is what you and I are left in this world for, believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are left in this world to declare the praises of God who has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. So we as Christians, we're in society and we are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness and brought us into his wonderful light. And nowhere is this more especially true than when it comes to our relationship to government and people in authority. Now verse 13, it jumps straight in here. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Every human authority, we are told. As Christians, we are responsible to obey. Every human authority. The law, basically. Peter exhorted his readers, readers to abide by governmental laws, those laws that come from the government, to submit to every human authority. Now, this is not a strange idea, is it? Paul talked about it in Romans, especially in chapter 13, and, and Paul talked about it in Timothy and in Titus. So what is the motivation, then, that we should place ourselves under the government and the laws the government makes. The motivation for obedience to these human authorities is not to avoid punishment, although that's good. We go under 30 miles an hour. Why? Because we don't want a speeding ticket. We don't go into somebody's house and steal because why? Well, we don't want to be thrown into court and found guilty and thrown into prison. But Peter says this is not a good motivation. The motivation is not to avoid punishment, but it's for the Lord's sake. Look at that. Submit yourself to every human authority for the Lord's sake. That is so we can bring glory to God by submitting, placing ourselves under the human authority we find ourselves under at this time. To honour God who ordained human government Christians, we are to observe carefully the laws of this land. Now let me qualify that. We observe the laws of this land made by the government as long as these laws don't conflict with the clear teaching of Scripture. Now this is what has caused a lot of problems even in churches during this year of lockdown. Because some people have said, well the government cannot impose into what is happening in the church. These are matters of conscience. The government has no right to get involved in these things. But you remember the story of Peter and John in Acts, don't you, when they were thrown into prison for, for healing the lame man. Uh, and the Sanhedrin said, don't speak in the name of Jesus again. And what did Peter and John say? All right, we won't do that. No, they didn't. He said, what is better to obey God or to obey man? We cannot but speak the name of Jesus. So there's an instance where believers went against what the leaders were saying. It was a matter of conscience. They were following scripture. If we went into the Old Testament too, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, the three guys who didn't burn. That's a good November the 5th <laughs> sermon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and even Daniel, they respected the leader, didn't they? The king, but they felt they needed to disobey and not bow down to that idol. 
But if we do that, we need to be responsible, we need to be willing to face the consequences of that. So, the general principle then is submit yourself, for the Lord's sake, to every human authority. The general purpose of the legal authority then is said here, whether to the emperor as assume its prime authority, or to governors who are sent to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. So verse 14 tells us the general purpose of the legal authority is what? To punish wrongdoers and to commend good doers. Now very often it doesn't work that way. How often have you had a letter from the government commending you for being a good citizen? I've not. I'm not. I've had a letter from the tax people thanking me for filling my taxes. But generally we don't get commended for being good, but if we do the wrong. So that's a, a general purpose. Uh, th th these people, governors, police, whoever, are sent by the supreme authority to punish those who do wrong and commend those, those who do right. Okay, verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of the foolish. Evidently, Christians were being slandered and falsely accused of evil. Now, Peter here stresses that it's God's will, and this is a theme we'll find uh, throughout the epistle of 1 Peter 2. He mentions the, the will of God quite often here. What is an excellent behaviour is that by doing good we will silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Now who are these foolish men that Peter is talking about here? Well in verse 12 we'd have seen last week, he said live good lives among the patient the pagans, that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So I think Peter is talking about these people. Uh, by doing good, we will silence these people who are talking badly about us. These ignorant talk, they don't know anything about what they're talking about. They don't know the Christian principles that we live our lives on. They're talking from a position of ignorance. And so by doing good, we will silence. And this Greek word means to put a muzzle on. A bit like I'm looking at now, you know, how it works. We put a muzzle on a dog because we don't want it to bark and we don't want it to bite people. And that's what Peter's saying here, using this word, for it is God's will that by doing good you should muzzle the ignorant talk of the foolish. And verse 16. Is, read through First Peter and mark off where it talks about God's will. I was going to go into that, but our time is limited here this morning. Uh, people talk, uh, God's will is not a mystery. It's not a mystery. If God wants you to do something, he's going to tell you what he wants you to do. And here's one, a sense of God's will, that by doing good, you will silence the ignorant, foolish talk of people who slander and tell lies. Verse 16 then, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Now submission to lawful authority does not negate Christian liberty, and I've heard this so many times throughout this year of lockdown. We have liberty in Christ. We can do whatever we want now. They're talking about license. That's not liberty. We are not free to do whatever we want. But we have freedom in Christ. Again, Galatians uh, talks about this. Civil laws are to be obeyed. I think that's basically uh, what it comes down to. Civil laws should be freely obeyed, not out of fear, because uh, by keeping those laws, by being involved as good citizens, we're actually being involved in God's will for us as believers, godly conduct. And Christian freedom is always conditioned by Christian responsibility. We should never use our, our freedom as a cover-up, as a cloak for evil. Uh, I love that term. 
Let's just uh, turn back to uh, Galatians uh, chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, because Paul speaks about this too. Talking about life in the Spirit and freedom in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 5, 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. You see, that would be license to say, well, well, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, I'm free in Christ, therefore I can do and freely be involved in X, Y, Z. Well, actually you can't, because that is indulging the old nature, which, which the Bible says is sin, and we should not be involved in sin. He says, do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, rather serve one another humbly in love. We should be about serving each other in love, not indulging the old nature. But unfortunately, there are those who take their liberty too far uh, as believers. Now actually, we can enjoy true freedom when we obey God and live as God's slaves. Well, you say, that, that, that can't be right. How can we be free and slaves at the same time? Uh, but the Word tells us that, doesn't it? Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. <coughs> live as God's slaves. Well, that's a paradox if there ever was one. Romans 6, 19 through 22. We, we will turn there. I, I can't keep saying... Note this down and look at it later, because I could be telling you a load of lies, couldn't I? But unless you follow it in your Bible and actually look at it and find it out for yourself. Okay, Romans 6, 19 through 22. Uh, this is what Paul has to say about this subject. <coughs> I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. Leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you now ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become what? Slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Wow, what a difference. What a difference. Free to be slaves to God, slaves to righteousness, to use our hands, our feet, our mouths, our eyes, our ears, all our faculties, not now for sin, and to indulge in the, uh, in the flesh, in the sinful nature, but now to bring glory to God. What a tremendous difference we find here. And though living as free men, then, Peter tells them they should live as God's slaves. Slaves to righteousness. Now Paul, has, I knew what I was going to say, Paul. Peter finishes this section, Peter finishes this section in verse 17, about our Christian conduct as citizens with four statements, four point summary of Christian citizenship. First he says, show proper respect to everyone. Show proper respect to everyone. Uh, this word means see their proper value. See every person's proper value. Uh, we should be conscious of the fact that every human being has been made in the image of God and is loved by God and that's how we should view everybody. He goes on to say secondly that we should uh, love our fellow believers. He goes without saying doesn't he? God's family members should but love each other. Third he says we are to fear God. We are to fear God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love your fellow believers. Fear God. The verb fear does not mean to be in terror. It's not like every time we think of God, our knees start to knock and we break out in a cold sweat. That's not the idea here. It's awe and reverence that leads to obedience. That is how we are to view God. 1 Peter 1.17, just across the page here, says this. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here, in 
reverent fear. That's what we're talking about here. Reverent fear in awe and reverence that leads us to desire to be obedient to God. One will never truly respect others unless we reverence God. And the fourth thing Peter says here is honour the king or honour the emperor. The interesting thing is, do you know who the emperor was at this time of writing? Nero. You've all heard of Nero, have you? The one who lit up his driveway with Christians covered in tar. Respect this man. Honour this man. Now, honour is the same word that's used for show proper respect to everybody, value them, uh, uh, especially to those God has placed in authority. Romans 13, 1 says there's no authority that's been established apart from God. You know, it's not like God has placed Nero on the throne, but God, way back in Genesis, established human government, didn't he? It's a God-ordained institution, and therefore they have to be uh, respected. So moving on to quickly to that second section here then, uh, the Christian conduct as slaves. Slaves, it says in verse 18, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Now this word of exhortation would cover made a lot of people at this time. There were a large number of Peter's first readers who would fit into this category of slaves and servants. A high percentage of the, the early church. And many, uh, an undeserved punishment and suffering would be a, a common uh, occurrence for them. Now to be sure, and Paul and Peter says here, there are good and considerate masters. Uh, and Christian slave owners would be amongst them, wouldn't they? However, Peter challenged slaves now to the new normal or new behaviour. He, he says this new behaviour is to submit to and respect those, even those who are harsh towards you. Now harsh here is from the Greek word skolios. And this is what we get where, where we get our word medical term scoliosis from. It says some masters will treat you harshly. Some masters will bend you and twist you into awkward situations. But he says it's these masters you need to submit to out of reverence for God. Now Peter sets forth a principle here. For it is commendable if you bear up under the pain of unjust suffering because you are conscious of God. A principle here that can be applied to any situation where unjust suffering occurs. If you're an employee and your boss uh, treats you harshly, then what do you do? The commendable motivation for pa patiently bearing up under harsh conditions and unjust suffering is again the believer's con consciousness of God. If we just flip over the page to 1 Peter 4, 19, we read this. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and do good. You know, it's good to be forewarned, isn't it? And therefore we can be forearmed. You know, it's a good idea to, to, to formulate your own doctrine of suffering, sufferingology, or however you would call it. You know, there's Christology, there's theology, there's harmatology, but you don't read much about sufferingology. But I would recommend you, you formulate something in your own mind, in your own families, that will see you through hard times. Because when you're going through suffering, it's not the time to suddenly think, oh, how should I handle this situation, this suffering? We, we can get into this position in, in 412. 
Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you as though some strange thing were happening to you. And that's, why, that's how most of us deal with suffering and hard times and trial. When it comes, we're like, whoa, what's happening? But we need to be forewarned and forearmed and have our doctrine already sorted out so that when these hard times come, we're not surprised and we're not taken uh, aback as though some strange thing were happening to us. And, and that's what Paul says here. We have to be conscious uh, of God's presence. We have to be conscious of God's awen uh, awareness of God's presence with us. Verse 20, there's no credit in receiving a beating for doing wrong and enduring it, that we're just getting what's due to us, really, or, or the slave is at this time. Verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now Peter powerfully supports this exhortation to slaves by citing Christ's example of endurance in facing unjust suffering. Now one translation renders this first phrase here, uh, for you have been called for this purpose referring to doing good while facing suffering. Now Christians, we're told to follow Christ. Now we're actually called to follow Christ. 1.15 uh, tells us this, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Uh, and we read uh, 2 verse 9, that you may uh, declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are for, called to follow Christ, to emulate his character and his conduct because he suffered for us. Now you might say, well, well now you've switched because this, this you're talking about slaves, right? Slaves have to do that because slaves are called to suffer for Christ. We're not. Uh-oh, sorry. Don't get away that easy. Uh, because we also know, if we would turn over the page to uh, chapter 3 and verse 9, Peter says this, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called. We've all been called to suffer for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who would live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So we don't get away with it by just saying, well, Paul, if Peter is referring uh, to slaves here. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in this body, arm yourselves also with this same attitude. This mindset, this attitude that Christ had about suffering, we should arm ourselves with that same attitude because those who have suffered in their bodies are done with sin. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but it, uh, as Peter closed this passage here, he quotes a lot from Isaiah 53, doesn't he? Uh, he says of Jesus that, uh, as an example, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth in verse 22. And that's from Isaiah 53, 9. You can look at that afterwards. He committed no sin before and during his suffering. He was completely innocent in both deed and in word, and no deceit, uh, the NIV says, was found in his mouth. Now that word found is a little bit different to was. No deceit was found in his mouth. It's stronger than simply was and indicates something that stood the test of scrutiny. Now, now later, go back over the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how many times Pilate says, I find no fault in him. You see, the sinlessness of Christ and the fact that there was no deceit found in his mouth stood up under scrutiny. Now, Jesus was the perfect example of patient submission to unjust suffering, verse 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Now, humanly speaking, at this time, the provocation to retaliate during his arrest, 
trial and crucifixion, what do you think? Was it extreme or was it just a little? I think it was awfully extreme. You know, humanly speaking, our, our response to, to this is to do what? To strike out uh, with words or, or even hands or fists or, or, or anything. So the provocation to retaliate was extreme for the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet we find he suffered in silence. Why? It says he entrusted himself to him who justly judges. Wow, what a mindset. Arm yourself with this mindset. So tomorrow, well it won't be tomorrow because it's a bank holiday, but when you go to work and your boss gives you a hard time, arm yourself with this mindset. Well it's easy to say from up here isn't it? And I don't see too many of you nodding because we know it's hard in practice. But this is what Christian life is all about, right? It, it, it's all about the, the, where the rubber meets the road. He suffered in silence, committing himself to God. Again, note no down Romans 12, 19 through 20. In verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to righteous, die to sin, and live for righteousness. By his wounds you are you have been healed. Again, quoting from Isaiah 53. The one who could have destroyed his enemies with one word patiently endured the pain and the humiliation on the cross. Why? Because God was justly judging our sin. Jesus would have just condemned everybody if he'd have just cursed everybody and come down from the cross our sins could not have been born on that cross of Calvary God was justly judging our sins which his son bore the death makes it possible for believers it says this is for us as believers his death makes it possible for us as believers to be free from both the penalty and the power of sin. We're free from the penalty of sin. Praise the Lord. But we're also being freed from the power of sin in the here and now. It says there, doesn't it? He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Romans 6.13 tells us Christ suffered so it would be possible for Christians to follow his example in suffering and righteous living. Now, now it's almost in passing here, Peter makes a, a general reference to salvation. By his wounds you have been healed. Uh, the main thrust of Peter's uh, quoting Isaiah 53 here uh, is to show that Christ did not retaliate when he was suffering. But, but Peter throws, it almost like he throws this in, by his wounds you have been healed. Now this does not refer to physical healing. Physical healing is not in the atonement as some believe. What is being talked about here then is this. Uh, it's, it's, it's a past uh, accomplished fact, the healing is an accomplished fact, and it's a reference to spiritual healing. Salvation in other words. Christ's suffering, the stripes, referred to the scourging, the scouring, and death accomplished this healing, the salvation of every individual who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25, for you were like sheep going astray. I just want to go on, Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ not only set the example and provides a salvation, but he also gives guidance to those who were headed the wrong way, for you were like sheep going astray. But now you have turned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Isaiah tells us that everybody is like sheep going his own way, heading away from God. 
Those who are headed away, it says, but who have now turned about and found the Lord Jesus Christ, not only to be their saviour, but their shepherd and their overseer. Oh, it's tremendous. This Christological content of Peter is amazing when we get into it here. You were like sheep going astray, but have now turned and to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The shepherd, of course, Jesus is the great shepherd. The overseer, he's the manager, the guider of those who have trusted him. We have guidance, of course, through his spirit and by his word. And he ever lives as our great high priest to intercede for us. So basically then, what have we seen here? The wonderful truth I think that Peter wants to share with us and has done is this. As we live godly lives and submit and do good, even in times of suffering, we're following Christ's example and we are becoming more like him. That is the goal of the Christian life. That is the goal of walking in the Spirit. That is the goal of being guided by the, the light. The Word of God is that we become more Christ-like. And so by following ex His example, living godly lives, even though we suffer uh, and, and submitting ourselves to the authority of God and those he, he has placed in authority, we submit and we obey for the Lord's sake, to bring glory to God. But also for our own sake, we could say, that we might grow spiritually and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just going to read as we close here and then I'll close in prayer, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 again, because I feel this is the main thrust of First Peter. I don't know what was said last week, but I, I think this is, is the central theme uh, of, the, of the book of First Peter. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's live according to our calling. This is what we are called to. Let's live up to this calling. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for these uh, very practical and important issues we've dealt with this morning, the fact that we are all under authority, that human governments have been uh, ordained by yourself way back uh, in the Old Testament days. Uh, and even though governments, Father, have, um, have failed, and governments are not always um, your instrument to do right and to do good, uh, Father, we thank you that in your wisdom you have placed them over us. And that as Christians we can show forth, uh, declare your praises or virtues uh, as we obey human laws and institutions. Father, we thank you for the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in face of terrible suffering opened not his mouth. He didn't retaliate. He didn't, uh, he didn't curse. He didn't, just like a sheep. Uh, before his shearers he's done, he opened not his mouth. We thank you for that time on the cross where he uh, procured salvation for us. Uh, we thank you that he bore our sins, the substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. We thank you that we are healed, that we are saved because of his finished work on the cross of Calvary. We pray for any this morning who don't know that assurance, who have no idea of these things of which we talked about this morning. Uh, Father, that they would um, want to know more. Uh, Father, thank you that we, we would pray that we'll be open and willing to discuss these things and that as a church, the gospel of the grace of God in our Lord Jesus Christ is fully and freely preached. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.